Good day and welcome back to Chemistry Videos with me, Clarissa Sorensen Unruh. I am going to talk about organic synthesis today. And it's going to be a little bit of a crazy moment because um, unlike usual organic synthesis where you have a reactant, you have a product, you just have to figure out which reactions go together to get from the reactant to the product, today we don't have a product. Instead, we have spectra. Okay, so we have a spectral analysis. And um, when you're doing this, usually you get three spectral analyses. You get mass spectra, where you get the elemental analysis and you get the molar mass. You get an IR spectra, so that you can identify what functional groups are on there. And then you get an NMR, proton or carbon. More often, we would get a proton NMR. I did not give you the proton NMR because it would take up this whole thing to kind of write it out. So we'll get there, we'll draw it out, and um, indeed it'll be what we thought it was. Okay, so that's kind of the sense. Mass spectra, IR, NMR, okay? The reason why you get all three is because with the mass spectra, we're gonna do, ele with the elemental analysis, we're gonna figure out the empirical and molecular formula. And the molecular formula tells us the numbers of C's, H's, and O's that I have in that compound, okay? The C's shouldn't, really change that much, but you never know. This is a, a synthesis problem. You never know whether I'm going to add C's or not. The IR spectra is going to tell me uh, what major functional groups are in that compound. Okay, so, and this is a pretty obvious one. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then the NMR would tell me how the carbons are arranged so that I can really figure out, okay, does my product that I've come up with actually match what should be there. Okay, so it tells you the order of the carbons and how they should be arranged with one another. All right, let's start off with the math spectra because that's where we need to begin. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna take those percentages and calculate the empirical formula. It's like kicking it old school, like general chemistry one, woohoo! All right, so let's do that. Here we go, 65.07, 10.8, and 24.77. What essentially I'm going to do here is I'm just going to read label these percents as grams. The assumption, of course, is that you have 100 grams of this stuff, um, of this compound. And if you have 100 grams of this compound, 65.07 grams of those would be carbon. 10.16 oh, would not be carbon. <laughs> Getting slap happy with carbon, sorry. 10.16 uh, grams of those would be hydrogen. And then the last would be oxygen. And then I need to remember what a formula tells me, right? It tells me the numbers of C's, H's, and O's in this molecule, this organic molecule. In case of the subscripts, right, if I had something like C6, H12, O6, what I could say here is I could say two things, right? I could say that in one molecule of C6, H12, O6, just taking it as an example, that there are six atoms of carbon somehow bonded to 12 atoms of hydrogen, which are somehow bonded to six atoms of oxygen. It's in one molecule, but because Avogadro's number is always the same, you can say the exact same thing in moles, right? So you could say in one mole of this, uh, mole of these glucose molecules, we're gonna call it glucose because it's a monosaccharide, I have six moles of carbon atoms, I have 12 moles of hydrogen atoms, and six moles of oxygen atoms. So because of that, I'm gonna go ahead and find moles, which is pretty easy, considering I give, I'm given grams. The way I go from moles to grams or grams to moles is with the molar mass. You would look it up on the periodic table. Luckily enough, I have these memorized I'm putting the number I find underneath the letters on the periodic table on the bottom so that my grams of carbon and grams of carbon can cancel out. All right, 1.01 .01 grams of hydrogen per one mole of hydrogen and 16 grams of oxygen for every one mole of oxygen. Look at that. And now I'm going to pull out my handy dandy calculator because it's handy and it's dandy. And I really like using it. it. Makes me very happy. And I'm going to calculate this out. 
All right, I got 5.41799 here. And I take it out to a lot of decimal places, a lot of places past the decimal point, because often that'll give me a better answer. It's just a math thing. All right, 10.0594. Moles of hydrogen, and then 27.24.77 uh, divided by 16 is 1.5481 moles of oxygen. And if you remember back to general chemistry one, the next step that we have is that we cannot use uh, acknowledging the fact that we never see decimals in the midst of a formula. We're going to divide all these numbers by the smallest number. Smallest number here is 1.5481. And if I divide all the numbers by the smallest number, hopefully that will get me to the place where I can talk towards whole numbers. That's really the reason why you're doing this, is you're trying to get to whole numbers. Oh, hey, <laughs> now it's a problem because right there I got 3.5. Okay, you can't round at this point. You got to keep the digits. It's 3.4997, right? What a bummer. That happens, though. Oh, I got 6.5 here, too. Boy, I'm just batting a whole bunch. And then, of course, one here. Again, you can't, you can't just round. Okay, so in this case, what I'm going to need to do is I'm going to need to take this 3.5, 6.5, and 1 and turn it into a whole number. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to treat the decimal point as if it's like change. I used to like making piles of change. Um, and so if I had 50 cents, how many piles of 50 cents or how many 50 cent coin pieces would I need to get a dollar? And the answer there is 2, right? So I'm going to take those three numbers and I'm going to multiply by two. So let's go back over here and erase this a little bit. I'm working in a small space, right? Make it all pretty and nice. And this is all a general chemistry one review. This is not even getting to the organic part, right? The really good stuff. So if you don't remember this general chemistry one review, remember I have videos on that too. So, don't, no worries, you can review with those. I'm going to eventually get them on YouTube, but right now, they're a little more embedded. All right. All right, so let me get my 3.5. This was moles of carbon. 6.5 moles of hydrogen. And one mole of oxygen. Okay, what am I going to do with these? I am going to um, multiply them by two. And that will give me my empirical formula. All right, so I got two. 6.5 times two is 13. And 3.5 times two is seven. Okay, so now that I finally have whole numbers, I'm going to say that these are my numbers that are my subscripts, right? So this is the empirical formula, the lowest ratio of those subscripts to one another for this compound, All right? So here we go. Empirical formula, C7H13O2. At this point, you should recognize that there's a problem, right? <laughs> because if I just use this, this has way more carbons than just seven. And getting rid of like seven carbons, I think this has 14 in it, okay? We could number it, um, and we certainly should probably at some point. Let's go ahead and do that right now. There it is. 14 carbons, 14 carbons is not the same as seven. And so unless we're cutting this in two different places, then the likelihood is that I'm going to need something more here. And that indeed is true because I need to do my last piece, which is taking the molar mass of the molecular formula 
So in other words, the molar mass of this compound as it naturally exists and dividing it by the molar mass of my empirical formula, right? And you know how to calculate a molar mass of C7H13O2. You just take 7 times 12.01. I'm doing this right now as we speak. Plus 13 times 1.01 .01 plus 2 times 16. And that gives me a number like 129.2 grams per mole. Okay, if I divide these out, then what I'm going to get is a multiplier. And you can probably see already that it's 2. I'm going to go ahead and divide it out anyway. There it is, it's 2. It sure is. So, having said that, what we know is that we know that we need um, to multiply every subscript in the empirical formula by 2. That's the point of doing the multiplier, okay? And there are other ways to get around doing this. I'm doing it this way because this is the same way I taught it for general chemistry one. Okay, so looking at those, the molecular formula, this is giving me the number of C's and H's and O's that I'm gonna actually use, right? The molecular formula in the end is two times seven, which is 14, I have a squeaky pen. Two times 13 gives me the number of H's, which is 26, and 2 times 2 gives me the number of O's, which is 4. So I have C14, H26, O4, which actually is a little bit better because that gives me at least the 14, right? All right, so let's go back over here and start saying, okay, well, that was good to know. It's good to know how many C's, H's, and O's I have to play with, right? But now I need to figure out how many, uh, what my major functional groups are. The, how many of them we have would be good, but that is not something you can really actually tell from an NMR. You can only tell what you have, not necessarily how many you have. Um, you would only be able to tell how many you have based off of the symmetry of the possibilities and the number of O's and such. Like if you have a ketone and you have two O's, that's a problem, right? A ketone only has one O, so you're trying to use up your number of O's as well. All right, so there's a, a moment there. Here's my molecular formula. That's awesome. I need to figure out what my functional groups are, and that we can do. Let's do that over there. Functional groups. I'm looking at the IR spectra. I'm looking at the fact that I have a sharp peak. It's a little bit wider, um, but it's a little bit sharp at the top between 2,800 and 3,000. This range is usually the place for alcohols, okay? And usually what you get in the wave numbers is if you have like 3,000 here, you get some really awesome blubbery something, right? <laughs> it looks kind of like that. That is very typical alcohol, it's this blubbery thing that is like dead giveaway. Here we had something that was a little more like that, okay? Still alcohol range, but probably an alcohol that's a little bit different, okay? So this is an alcohol. Um, the dead giveaway of an alcohol is the big blubbery one. This one is probably an alcohol combined with something else. So we need to figure out what else we got. And here we have the sharp peak between 1680 and 1700. That is a dead giveaway of a carbonyl. So that means that we have a carbonyl. The weirdness of the alcohol probably means that we have a carboxylic acid. So these two are really giving me a sense of, hey, you probably got a carboxylic acid here, which is awesome because that's exactly what I wanna know. I wanna know not only do I have um, this formula, I know my C's, my H's, but I need to know that I have a carboxylic acid. And I didn't have anything else. The interesting thing here is that there was nothing else really interesting in this uh, IR spectra. Those were the two main peaks, which means that I probably only have carboxylic acids. But if I have a carboxylic acid, remember that looks like this. 
All right. I have a C double bonded to an O immediately by an O to an H. The interesting thing here is that that takes up one, two O's. That's not just a ton of O's compared to what I have. So the likelihood here is if I have two per carboxylic acid and that's the only thing it's telling me, then these other two O's are probably another carboxylic acid. Kind of crazy, huh? So I probably have not one, but two carboxylic acids. All right, so having said that, that's helpful to know. That was, I've deconstructed this. I have a molecular formula that actually has something close to the same numbers of C's, right? And I have, um, now I know I have two car carboxylic acids. That is phenomenal. So, now that I have all of this, what I would need is I would need the NMR, okay? And the NMR is a little bit weird in this case. It has a peak far down field, and then it has very few peaks, relatively speaking, compared to what it should have, all right? So, now that I know these two pieces, let's look at the NMR. And the NMR was a little bit weird. Let me give you a sense of what this looked like. I'm going to draw it from what I have here. It had, the proton NMR had, of course, the zero peak, right? So zero is way down here. Oh, I even put it off the screen. Woo! All right, that's the TMS peak, which is just as well because we don't need to know that as much. All right, and then around one, this is between one and two, you have something that looks kind of like really tall with some splitting, but it's really hard to tell the splitting. And then you have something a little bit shorter that looks like it might be a triplet. Ooh, let's make that a little bit better. All right, so something like a triplet. All right, so triplet right there. And then you have something that looks a little bit more like, um, hmm, that looks like it might be a triplet as well. So let's, uh, actually it looks like it might be, yeah, hmm, this, this is a little bit weird. So that's a little bit triplety. This is a little bit triplety. Okay, so obviously if I was running this spectra, it would be a little bit better than what we got. Um, and this one actually is not triplety. That is actually a hextet. So it actually looks like, it looks a little bit more like that. Um, uh, these are hard to tell what the heck is going on. I'm looking at a chem draw moment here, so you can forgive me for a sec. Let's go back a little bit here and erase all of this. All right, so that's a definite triplet. This one is either a hextet or a septet. I mean, sorry, not a hextet. Um, a, a pent uh, it has five peaks or six peaks, I'm not quite sure. Here's one, here's two. This is a little bit further down. And then way, 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 way downfield. Like all the way down here, we have a single peak and it's like around 11. All right, so since I can't see this very well, we're gonna go with general ideas, right? So I can't really tell exactly what's going on here, but I can tell enough of what's going on. Okay, so. And that's true sometimes when you're looking at this. Ideally, you would have a nice NMR, and ideally you would have some nice integration that really says, hey, this is how many you have here. If you had all of that information, it makes it way, way, way easier. But, you know, we don't have all of that information, so we're just gonna punt, it's fine. Okay, so what we have here is we have this 11 peak. All right, that peak at number, at um, the, the 11 on 
the proton and a Mars cell. This is um, chemical shifts. So it's a chemical shift of 11. All right, so what does that mean? That typically means some kind of OH group again. Okay, so again, it's way downfield. It shows up on the proton NMR because it is an H. It has an H attached, but it is way downfield because it is um, attached directly to something really electronegative, like oxygen. So in that case, we need to, um, that kind of confirms my OH group which is awesome. I need to figure out the arrangements of most of these. And since I only have like three peaks, I'm going to guess that the vast majority of this is symmetrical. Okay. So in other words, the carboxylic acids, I'm going to put on the ends and I'm going to put the, the rest of the carbons in the middle. Okay. So what I'm going to do is given that I have 14 carbons, okay, this is a very, and I, I didn't, Get the, I mean, I don't have integration values. I don't have all kinds of stuff. It's if, like I said, if it had integration values, that would make it way, way easier. And if I could actually read it really nicely, it would make it way, way easier. But you can't always look and get all of that. Only if you're running your own NMRs do you really get that usually, and you know to put all of that stuff in. So let's say that I have 14 peaks, right? So let's start counting over here because I'm about to run off the screen here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I said 14 peaks there. I'm sorry, I meant 14 carbons. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 maybe? Let's see, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Nice. Okay, so this has an OH off of it. I'm going to erase that little 14 here and put it underneath because it's interfering with my beauty, my beautiful moment here. And let's put the carbonyl there. This is number 14. All right, and then let's put the carbonyl on the opposite side, right? Here and put the carboxylic acid there. Okay. Does this structure reiterate my molecular formula? It certainly does my carboxylic acids and the NMR. Let's double check. Okay, I need 14 carbons. I need 26 H's, right? So assuming that each of these in the middle would have two H's, I have two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, and then 26 on the two H's on the end, on the alcohols. Woohoo! I have. 14 C's, that's labeled, and I have four O's. This works, isn't that wonderful? Love that, has the carboxylic acids from the IR spectra, and then it has this OH way far down. I need to figure out if I have something that's close to what this looks like, kind of. Um, and like I said, you can make this a lot better, and we will in a second show you what it really would come out as if you were doing it on your own. All right, so what I should have here is I should have, since this is symmetrical, these two carbons look different, these two carbons look different, but then all of these carbons in the middle probably look fairly the same. Okay, why do these two carbons, they, they look the same as each other, but are different from the rest of the crew is because they are closest to the carbonyl. Okay, question, would we have these carbons show up? And answer is no, because they don't have any H's on them. So here we would look at these carbons 2 and 13. We would expect those to be slightly further downfield because they're directly bonded to the carbonyl carbons. Um, and they should, let's see what their splitting should be, right? So in terms of this carbon, while it itself has two hydrogens, I'm not looking at the splitting based off of the number of hydrogens that are on it, I'm looking at the splitting based off of the number of hydrogens on its next nearest neighbors. Its next nearest neighbors are these two. When you look at these two, this carbon doesn't have any H's, but this carbon has two H's, which means that if it's, if the number of H's, if you remember, is N, then the splitting is N plus one, right? So I should have, if this has two H's, 
around these, then I should have a triplet here, right? So the furthest, furthest down field, relatively speaking, not including the OHs, should have a triplet on it as a split, okay? And that's going to be true for carbons 13 and 2. And look there. Hey, if life was ideal, right, then this would have a little 4 on top of it to tell you that there are four hydrogens, those carbons with hydrogens attached, four hydrogens that have this particular splitting. Let's look at the next nearest one. So three and 12 are what we look, we're looking at next. And again, I need to fill in my C's and my H's here. All right, so in this case for three and 12, so this is, by the way, two and 13 in terms of carbons, right? For 3 and 12, I'm looking at these, woohoo, right there. And these two probably look very similar because they are one carbon away from the carbon neo carbon. Okay? And so here, I would expect these to split um, if I count my number of n's, which are my number of h's on the next nearest carbons. Not on the carbon itself, next nearest carbon. So here, on number 11, I have two. On 13, I have two, which means that I have four H's. N plus one means that this should be, so numbers three and 12 have a splitting of a quintet, right? So, woo. And this is the next furthest downfield. And lo and behold, there it is. Love that. An ideal in an ideal world, this would also say four, right? Because it would tell me that I'm looking at two carbons with two H's each that should be housed by that peak. And then the rest of these, this one was very unclear. It was very tall though. And tall means that it's a stronger um, response. It has a stronger response, which means that it would make sense because all of these carbons are looking the same. And in each of these, let's just take a, a view. We're going to say these are numbers four through 10, no, four through 11, four through 11, mmm, crazy. Let's just take a look at number four here, right? So four is here, three has two H's. Wow, that's a really bad moment of a bond to an H, isn't it? So sorry, All right? And then I have Looking on either side of number four, okay. I have two carbons with two H's attached to each. My N here would be four. So this should also be a quintet, right? And ideally, you would have had a blow up of this to show, hey, in the box, while you can't see it, is really a quintet, and it's a strong response, and in that quintet, the integration would have a lot of H's, right? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. 16 H's. Oh, you can't even see that. I'm so sorry. So in terms of looking at this, right, you would have seen, let me do it towards the other side so that you guys can see it what I'm talking about here. The box, the box, the box, woo, would have shown a quintet, and ideally it would have said its integration is 16. So that you would have said, hey, that's a lot of um, hydrogens <laughs> that are there, right? And this would, be, would have been in an ideal world. And so I'm looking at this and I'm saying, this fits the bill. This fits all of my pieces for what I want. Problem now, I have to go from one to the other. Okay, so I need to, now that I finally have my product, I need to do something with it, okay? We'll save that for the next video. Join me again to see the mechanism, or that really the synthesis reaction for this particular reaction. Until next time, adieu. Oh yeah.